suddenly sound tracks are here to provide you. Suddenly sound tracks will show you you can. Oh, be more the soundtrack inside you. Sweet understanding, oh, what sweet understanding, what sweet understanding, soundtracks are your friend. Hey guys, welcome to a very special episode of Suddenly Soundtracks, the show where we dissect a movie, movie musical song by song and judge a movie solely based on the soundtrack that it provides. The show is super simple. We go through each song on a soundtrack and rate each song. Either rockin', download the track, one time listen, skip it, or burn the master tape. Then after doing so, we go through the song list and rank each song from worst to best. And since this particular film has cut musical numbers, we will go through a separate section where we go through all the deleted material and decide whether it should have been in the film or it should not have been in the film through a section called Cut It or Keep It. You guys know the drill, but this 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 episode is very special. I am here with a very special guest from the you know from the Schmoodown, you know from Got oh. Cancelled Too Soon, oh. <laughs> one of the best heels in the business, uh, Mr. Whitney Seibold. How are you doing, my man? Oh, good, thank you. Good. It's it's a, an honor to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's this is going to be fantastic. We're going to be going through a movie from 1966, a musical that uh, is very far and very Monty Python-esque. Um, when he suggested this to me, I was like, okay, this is a typical Whitney musical. This is a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Because I'm a family slave. What's the good of belonging to a family if you're going to be executed by strangers? If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, do not ban the girls when they're wet. But you'll never learn. You'll be a eunuch all your life. My father will turn in his grave. Your father is alive. This will kill him. Something that's funny. Something that's funny. Something for everybody's day. Pantaloons and tunics. Partisans and eunuchs. Funerals and chases. Baritones and basses. Panderers. Philanderers. Cupidity. Timidity. Mistakes. Fake. Rhymes. Rhymes. Tumblers. Rumblers. All right, guys, we are going to go straight into this movie. On, uh, oh. A funny thing happened on the way to the form was directed by Richard Lester with music by Stephen Sondheim, I think. Is, is that how you pronounce his last name? Yeah, uh, Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim. Yep, and it stars uh, Zero Mistel and Phil Silvers. And this is basically a mu movie musical based in ancient Greece where... Oh, it's, it's ancient Rome. Ancient Rome. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Based in ancient Rome. See, I, I'm human. Uh, and it's it's a very, very farcical piece. But before we get into it, Whitney, why did you choose A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Former? When did you first see it and why do you love it so much? Uh, well, I mean, this this is one of my favorite movie musicals. Um, I was a big, big uh, Roman history buff growing up for God knows what reason. But uh, when I think it started when I was in the seventh grade and I started taking Latin classes. And when you take Latin, you have to learn the context because Latin is not conversational. So we had to start learning about Roman history. And in order to teach us about Roman history, more than one of my uh, professors 
showed us a funny thing happened on the way to the forum because there are some things in it that are vaguely historically accurate. <laughs> so we, and uh, there, it also makes a sort of, because of its farcical nature, uh, kind of borrows heavily from the uh, Roman playwright Plautus. Uh, so we got to learn about Roman theater. We got to learn about Roman history all while watching this broad, really slapsticky 1960s movie musical with Zero Mostel. Um, <laughs> And yeah, we, we watched it over and over again. I always loved it. I always loved sharing it with friends. Nobody loved it as much as I did, but that's par for the course throughout my life. And uh, yeah, just just uh, it's continued to be one of my favorites to this day. And now you can find it on like Filmstruck and stuff. It might finally be getting a, a bit of its due. This is actually the first time I actually heard of this musical when you sent it to okay. me. I'm like, and I'm like, damn, this is actually, this is interesting. It stars Zero Misto. I loved him from the producers. And so I yeah. checked it out. And Phil Silver, as you know him from A Mad Mad World, for example, he is a very, yeah. very, very iconic comedian. And I watched it and I'm like, this movie, this, mu this is a musical, but it's, I'm, it's less so... We'll get into it. It's not necessarily the songs are memorable, but the actual set pieces and what they do with the songs is what I was really interested in. I uh, will get into yeah. the songs in a second. But um, yeah, this movie musical is very interesting. It is based on the playwright Platius. Pl 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 What's his name? Pl Plotus. Plotus. Yes. And, or or um, Pl Plautus, if you will. Plautus. Yeah. And um, just, just fair warning. These names are really hard to pronounce when we talk about the plot. So I might I might F up. It, 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 is, it is what it is. But before we actually get into the plot, we're going to get into the first opening number of the actual film itself, which is called Comedy Tonight. Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. This is basically catapults you into what this movie is about it feels like a stage show to be completely honest because there's the, the, the at the beginning they pretty much tell you what the whole movie is about with clips from the actual movie through this montage comedy <laughs> tonight which i didn't expect and i was like damn that is some mel brooks shit right there um you know what whitney you can probably talk about this better than i can what are your thoughts on comedy oh. tonight well, uh, you're right in saying that this sort of sets the stage, and this comes from mm -hmm. the traditions of Roman theater. And in fact, in the Broadway musical, the first line of dialogue that's spoken before comedy tonight is a little introduction by the main character, Pseudolus, who addresses the audience directly. He says, playgoers, I bid you welcome. The theater is a temple. And this all draws from the way uh, Roman theater was produced and the way, and which also comes from Greek theater, where there was a chorus that would address the audience as well as the action. So the main character is a, a member of the drama, but he's also narrating the drama. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a, in movie form, that's actually just a, for, a fun way to break the fourth wall and let you know that what we're seeing is not to be taken seriously at all. This is the, you know, the same year as Batman the movie. This is a really broad type of farce that was really hip at the time. This is the era of uh, the original Casino Royale. There was a lot of this kind of self-aware comedy that was coming out of the late 1960s. So it was actually a really good fit to have this uh, movie and this song come out at that time. Uh, so he turns to the audience, he says, what you are seeing is a comedy. This is going to be as silly as possible. Don't worry about any of the drama. Don't sweat it. And so he says, something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone is this broadly appealing, broad farce. There's a lyric in the original stage production that was cut from the movie production because it's theatrically bent. <laughs> but uh, one of the lyrics is, nothing that's grim, nothing that's Greek, that, that is not a tragedy, and then Pseudolus points to one of the actresses and says, she plays Medea later this week. <laughs> so just to let you know, this is all artifice. And it's okay to have fun with this silliness. And that you have someone like Zero Mostel who comes from theater to underline that makes it the perfect introduction for what you're about to see. Indeed. Uh, Zero Mostel is a tr national treasure. We miss him dearly. This, his voice, I didn't expect Zero Mostel to sound so good. And he really, really <laughs> does. Because uh, the mm. producers, the original, wasn't a musical. Um, so I never heard him yeah. sing before. So this this, this was fantastic. To me, this is a great way to open what is a really, really, I would say, farcical, 
what the fuck kind of movie? Like, there's a bunch of things that are like, <laughs> what the hell are they thinking with jump cuts and the way they cut this movie is really d- ridiculous. It's not bad in any stretch of the imagination. And for me, oh, no. for me, uh, I would say that comedy tonight is a rockin'. It's a really rockin', rockin' intro. What, what, what do oh, you, for what, sure. What do you give it, Whitney? Uh, I also give it a rock, and it's not only just a great fit for this film, uh, it kind of stands alone. This is something that you can just sort of hum at the beginning of, you know, while you're doing your laundry. Uh, it, it it does, it can play outside of the film. When you listen to the Broadway version, that one's a little specific. This one's a little bit more universal. Mm-hmm. You can start talking about just comedy is what you love, and here's just a song about how great comedy is. Um, yeah, it's it's one of one of the Broadway greats, in my opinion. I'm, I yeah. ha- have strange taste, to be sure, <laughs> but uh, yeah, 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 it's fantastic. And what's really odd about this musical is this: in the Broadway show, there's like we're gonna get to the cut Broadway songs later in the in the show, but for now, there's a there's a huge in the actual movie a music dead zone, where like there's no real songs until this upcoming song we're going to talk about. But before uh-huh. that, we are established to the main character, Sadalus, who was played by Zero Mistel. He's a slave mm-hmm. who just earns, earns, earns to be free and will do anything to lie and cheat to get his way. But then we are introduced to Hero, who uh, has, a, has an affection for Philia, who is this beautiful, beautiful damsel. And he wants her. Well, she, she's not just she's not just yeah. a damsel. Yeah. She's, a, she's, a, a courtesan. she's a courtesan. She's a courtesan. Yeah, <laughs> and she's a, a virginal courtesan who lives in the brothel next door. And, the brothel uh, was fantastic. The scheme is to get her out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they both scheme to get her out with the intention of if he can get uh, Philia for Hero, Hero will grant. Sadalus is freedom. That's the essential. That is, that's the essential gist of what happens in between these two songs. So once that happens, and um, you're introduced to the brothel, which is actually run by the great Phil Silvers. Which this whole sequence is really, really, really long. <laughs> it's a little too long, in my opinion. But um, well, there's wish- there is a dance number in yeah. there, and it's. It's not, oh golly, yeah. is it ever sexist? Um, <laughs> it, it, the movie stops just so it can ogle the hot chicks for yeah. a second, and uh, you just kind of have to roll with that. It, it is a product mm-hmm. of its time. Um, you know, you look at any James Bond movie as that same kind of yeah. uh, ogly sexist feeling. It, it's so lighthearted that it's okay to mm-hmm. enjoy, but yeah, it, it is yeah. definitely a sexist sequence where it's, all it's, of the. Uh, yeah potential courtesans are marched out in front of Pseudolus and Hero, and they <laughs> and, kind of get to choose which one they like the best. And, and Zero Mistel's uh, and Pseudolus really, really loves it. The Broadway production was more than just, a, like, they turned it into just a dance number, but yeah, mm-hmm. there was actually verses that Marcus Lycus, Lycus, which means Fox, uh, <laughs> Marcus Lycus sang to uh, to Pseudolus and Hero about how great his brothel was. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing either Phil Silver's didn't want to sing or they cut it for time or they would have fit, the song yeah. in the show. It actually has a different mood. Uh, Marcus Lycus is, is a bit more of a blowhard in the show. And in this one, he's a bit more of a, it kind of has more pathos. He's a bit more of a pathetic character. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it wouldn't have fit to have Phil Silver sing a song in that. Yeah, and my, and having Phil Silvers oh. play a pathetic person is always perfection. But anyway, we're gonna. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. But anyway, we're gonna go right into. Uh, as I was alluding to, there's a second song that happens like 20 minutes into the movie after the opening sequence, where um, uh, Hero is singing to Philia, saying uh, with a song called "Lovely." I'm lovely. All I am is lovely. Lovely is the one thing I can do. Which essentially yeah. establishes that they are starting to have affection for each other. Uh, Whitney, I'm going to go to you. What do you think of the song Lovely? Um, lovely is, like, kind of has a boring melody, but I think that might be by design. Um, this is sort of maybe a send-up of the way... Broadway love songs tend to operate about how the young people fall in love and they sing about how great it is to be in love. In this one, they're not singing about being in love. They're singing about how good she looks and how empty she really is. 
and they just keep repeating the word lovely, lovely over and over again to show that the lyrics aren't all that creative. And I think it's meant to paint the lovers as kind of dolts in a way. <laughs> the, the son is kind of an idiot. Philia is just naive. She's not a dummy, but yes. uh, she doesn't have a lot of dimension. And that could be said of most of the breeding couples in a lot of ancient theater. You look at something like, um, like a Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, you know, the reason we go to that is to see the side characters, Beatrice and Benedict, uh, actually kind of bicker and argue and be the interesting couple. The main characters are actually Claudio and, incidentally enough, a character named Hero. Uh, Claudio and Hero and Much Ado are completely boring. They are only swept up by the circumstances. They are the function of the plot. And I think Sondheim, when he was writing Lovely, understood that these two characters are just plot functionaries. Pseudolus is the main character. Mm -hmm. The happiness and the ultimate happy ending is going to be contingent on whether or not uh, Hero and Philia get together. But we don't care about them. <laughs> is this kind of sly way of undermining what we're supposed to feel about those characters. Um, this, however, is all very intellectual, I suppose. Actually listening to the song is can still be a little bit dull. So they try to dress it up a little bit. They have a, a, a bit in the middle of the song in the movie mm -hmm. where Hero is tuning a lyre in the middle of the song and he can only play one note. Um, <laughs> just to sort of give a little bit of com comedic action to this otherwise boring song. When they bring it back, that's, that's where it becomes where it gets hilarious. Different. That's where it becomes different. And I'm actually going to go with, with what you were saying is that yes, in the movie itself, it actually works because I, I got the fact that it was taking a jab at, because they're, they're basically MacGuffins. They really are the MacGuffins yeah. to the plot. And, and this is a, 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 a necessary song that you would see in any musical where two lovebirds find love. That's nothing interesting. And they make it even more uninteresting. And that's the whole joke of it. The problem with yeah, that yeah, is yeah. for me is that since I'm judging this solely based on the soundtrack, mm. you're not going to go back to lovely as much as you would if you were watching it. So if you're listening to lovely by itself, damn, is it boring? But 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 the, <laughs> the joke surrounding it, the joke surrounding it in the movie itself makes it work. So for me, Lovely gets a one time listen, not not a terrible song, but I just don't see the replay value when you're on, on iPod and you're shuffling through songs. Uh, Whitney, what do you th what do you give Lovely? Uh, I, it's hard to say because I'm you know, I'm so fond of this whole musical. That mm -hmm. I, I, I'm loath to to cut anything out, but uh I would give it a, a, a download the track. I think there's enough of Sondheim's mm -hmm. cleverness kind of hiding in it that were you to give it another listen, you might kind of start to appreciate it. Also, this is a wonderful audition type of song. If you're a theater kid and you want exactly. to you know, step on, on stage and make just show off that you can sing, this is a f fun enough song, but still requires enough of sort of the gentle love song chops that you can get away with both. Um, for what that's worth, I'd give it a, a download. Indeed. Yeah, uh, Lovely isn't bad. It's just, um, it's two different tastes and it's it, it works for the actual film. This yeah, next yeah, yeah. song, on the other hand, oh my God. Okay. Everybody ought to be <laughs> having me. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yay! Everybody ought to have a me. Everybody ought to have a serving girl, a loyal and unswerving girl, who's quieter than a mouse. Um, okay. Uh, this song is what I consider, what I would think of if I was to think of a funny thing happened to the form. You have Phil Silvers, you have Zero Mistel, oh. you have, who plays Hysterium? Jack Guilford, and uh, who's the fourth guy? Senex, uh, Michael Horden, all, oh, yeah. all singing this track as a quartet. They are awkward. Uh -huh. It's awkwardly edited, which is the whole joke of it. And they, 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 uh -huh. they it's so absurd in how it's staged. Uh, everybody ought to have a maid is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a dirty old man song. And again, 
I, it's difficult to tell if Richard Lester is staging this as something that's meant to kind of condone the attitudes of the characters or if he's kind of making fun of the characters. I guess you can interpret it either way. Um, Zero Mostel, uh, Phil Silver's, uh, oh God, Hysterium and Senex, the, those, those four characters are all older guys. In fact, the word Senex is the Latin word for old man. So they, uh, they're essentially just ogling young women. Mm-hmm. Or rather, they're singing about ogling young women. The camera stays off of the women. It just films them, and they're talking about how much they like to ogle young women. And that's it. Uh, it's kind of out of place. Ah, golly. Uh, yeah, it, I laugh, it's absurd. I, I laugh yeah. at it in spite of myself. It's incredibly catchy, which is a big problem. <laughs> It's something that anytime somebody like mentions they have a maid, I start singing it. Like it, it starts going through my head. So yeah, it, it it's really kind of on the fence for me if I can say if it's a great yeah. song or not. The whole setup to the song is great too, with Senex coming to the door and realizing that Philia is is there, and she just she thinks he's the Phil, captain. Philia is now she's yeah. been taken from from the brothel. She's yes. now living in some house with Hero, but they can't <laughs> tell Hero's father that. So they tell Hero's father Senex that she's the new maid that because they have all kind of, they're a rich family they have a lot of slaves and uh, so they just say oh she's just the new maid he's like ah good a hot a hot young maid why don't we stop and sing a song about the hot young maid it's so absurd but you know what it works so well in my opinion just uh the song itself is just great and it's catchy it does nothing for the plot it really doesn't it's just <laughs> there but you know what for for a movie like this does it really matter? Does it really matter? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, uh, you know what, Whitney, I'm going to go to you first. What do you give uh, Made? I'm going to give it a download the track. Um, it, it's, it, again, it's, it's too catchy. It's a little too iconic. And uh, even though it's of its time, I think you can still sort of appreciate how backward it might be. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting sort of artifact. I actually give it a rock and I loved it to death. I really did okay. how it was edited, but you know what? It, it is what it is. And um, it, it's the most what the fuck moment of the entire, of the entire movie. But um, I like that a lot about it. So moving on. Okay. So we are going, we get a bit more of a song kind of dead zone, but then you are introduced to the captain. Who, oh, Miles Gloriosus. Yeah. <laughs> Who's actually played by Leon Green, who was the original captain on Broadway, too. He comes and he, he basically the agreement with uh, Marcus Lycus was that he would pay Marcus Lycus a certain amount of money so he could get a girl. And this was the girl he was promised. So he comes back to the city and his baritone voice in this song kills i love i love i love leon's voice <laughs> um the song itself though um my bride my bride i've come to play my bride come tenderly to crush her against my side i th- i even though the performer he's really really great he's got mm-hmm. a great voice and i think he doesn't sing this song well uh Miles gloriosis is uh which is Latin for a, you know a, a a thousand glories. He's just mm-hmm. he thinks of himself as sort of the the best of all Roman soldiers. Uh, he is a conqueror. He's a slaughterer. He and he's uh, darn good at what he does, and he feels very highly about himself. Uh, so he sings a song about himself. He sings his own entrance song. This is a moment of comedy. We're supposed to be laughing at how ridiculous this guy is. You know, one of the lyrics is like, look at the thighs, look at the chest, look at that, not to mention the rest. Even mm-hmm. I am impressed. Um, there, there's a way to really sell that. If you got somebody like, say, um, John Senna, like a big buff dude who actually has a lot of comedic chops, that song would kill. This guy is if it's a straight Broadway song. So he's really able to tap into kind of his operatic voice qualities, but he's not selling the comedy in the song. So you kind of have to look at the lyrics on a sheet or listen to it a couple times to really appreciate how funny it is because he's not making it funny. I'm not laughing so much at this guy. 
the same could be said like he has a song later on where uh he sings a funeral dirge and mm -hmm. again he's singing it so straight that it sounds like just a regular funeral dirge even though there's a lot of funny lyrics um sondheim wrote great lyrics that was one of his great talents so we need to uh highlight that a little bit more rather than allow him to to sort of indulge in frankly his his high talents yeah. um what i'm what i think is like i think you hit the nail on the head his baritone does sound fantastic but the, the thing is mm -hmm. it doesn't fit the song necessarily for the movie um i would i would imagine on stage and live it would work better but this might be one of the few cases in cinema where Casting the original actor to play it from the stage show probably hindered it a little bit. Um, the song itself, mm. I hinted at, I'm not a fan of. It's not necessarily that memorable to me. And I feel like something stronger could have been in its place with better, I don't know, just better. It just it should have been a little bit more show stoppy because there's, there's so few song, uh, songs in this film that I feel like this needed to be bigger than it actually was, if that makes sense. Um, so, well, it, it's, it's a moment of. To, to go into theatrical parlance again, yep. it's a moment of, of pageantry. There was a, a, a you, you said showstopper, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what it was supposed to be. I think you know when the character comes out on stage, you get that guy on stage. He's great because he can sing to the back of the freaking room, and he comes in and he has this retinue of hundreds of people, and everybody's in costumes and on horses and waving flags. It's this big deal that this character is coming on stage and. In the film, they edit it in such a way where we got to see all of the people who are marching behind him and we get to see the, the, the flags waving. But since it's taking place on a movie set and everybody else is in costume and it's a little bit more dynamic cinematically, mm -hmm. we're robbed of that pageantry. You either needed to film it much bigger, which the, sh the film didn't have the budget to do, or you need a funnier actor to do it so you can sort of layer it in with what's already been established. And it it doesn't work as well in the film as it does on stage. Yeah. And for me, I give it a one time listen. Uh, it has yeah, too many flaws. Listen. Yeah. You give that, you agree with that, Winnie? Yeah. Yeah. One time listen for sure. Yes, indeed. 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 Probably the weakest song, in my opinion, of the film itself. Uh, then we get into, okay, the funniest <laughs> song in the actual film itself. Pseudolus tells Milos Gloriosus that Philia has died. Mm -hmm. and in, in order to get out of it and they expect him to leave but he doesn't he says he, we want to have a big funeral and i want to see the body and so pseudolus convinces hysterium to dress as the dead philia to be in the middle of the funeral <laughs> and then he and, wants to cremate her yeah beautiful and, well, later on it's revealed that he wants to cremate her but uh yeah Hysterium very reluctantly goes along with this plan. This is this is a plot from an episode of F yeah. Troop. This is ridiculous crap going on right now. It is yeah. farce. It is wonderful. So we have Hysterium dressed as the dead Philia and Pseudolus kind of sussing out how he looks. Like he'll never pass for a, a lovely dead courtesan. And he says, look at me. Just look at me. And, and Pseudolus to him and says, I can't take my eyes off you. And they launch into a reprise of Lovely. <laughs> I'm lovely, absolutely lovely. Who believe the loveliness of me? <laughs> and this reprise and it's terrific. is terrific. It's basically the, the, the lovely, but ten times less boring. <laughs> Just 10 times less boring. <laughs> and their chemistry during this song is fantastic. Uh, Whitney, what are your thoughts well, on the it, actual it, song it was, itself? Yeah. Well, it, it was revealed in this sequence that the original Lovely, the, kind, the one that was kind of boring, was a framing device. It was a setup. Because they shoot it in the exact same way that they shot the first Lovely, but now it's with these two ridiculous older men. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear what the intention was all along. So... When you pair them, all of a sudden it becomes brilliant. And the first one becomes all the more brilliant because it was filmed so flatly. We realize those romantic flat angles and those kind of wispy, dreamy uh, tones are completely ridiculous and farcical when sung by different characters. Yeah, It, it actually becomes something kind of genius uh, when you realize that the first one that you were kind of snoring through was only a setup for this punchline. 
and the whole movie starts to fall into place a little bit better. Yeah, and that's the one reason. This is the one reason why I didn't say skip it to lovely because this is the <laughs> payoff that we wanted, and this is just hilarious, hilarious farce. And this farce you see here in this movie, you can see like the misunderstandings and everything that happened from this song. You, you see it in Frasier a lot. A lot of Frasier <laughs> happens. Uh, I could see a lot of Frasier in this movie. Like, I, I don't know how big you are in Frasier, but like the misunderstandings, the farcical stuff that happens in that show and other shows like that is what made me actually adore this song because it gave me those flashbacks to the shows that I love. Yeah. Whitney, what do you give this? Hmm. Uh, I, I, I give it a rockin'. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that this just, I, I can't watch this sequence without laughing or, it, it make it repurposes the, a song that I previously didn't like in a way that made me realize what a fool I was, and uh, that little bit of catharsis was was greatly appreciated. Dude, I'm right there with you, Rock, and it's it, complete opposite of Lovely, and it gives it the payoff that it needed. Moving on from mm -hmm. that, we actually just alluded to this. Um, this whole setup is a setup for the burial of um, Philia or um, Hysteria and Drag. And it's revealed that um, <laughs> the captain would like to cremate her body. And uh, they have this whole funeral procession for her or him. Sound the flute, blow the horn, lock the lute, forward moon. It's really, really good and it's well paced. And you can see that I just don't, I love the fact that you're looking at like, how can you not tell that's a man? How can you not tell that person <laughs> is not dead because he's literally it's, breathing? It's funny as it's, hell. It's, it feels like theater. It's it feels night. like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's Twelfth Night Syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen plenty of, of productions of Twelfth Night and never ever does Viola look like a boy. Like she, she goes into drag as a boy so she can infiltrate the court. The seed is that, oh, you know, a woman thinks she's a boy and falls in love with him, him slash her. And you just kind of have to accept that this woman looks like an attractive mm -hmm. young man. I, I, I don't care how talented that actress is. I've never seen a production where it's actually convincing. So you have to suspend your disbelief. Oh, of course. Um, I think they're also making fun of that in yeah, this because Hysterium doesn't look anything like Philia. <laughs> Hysterium looks like a 40 year old man. <laughs> That's the whole joke. Yeah. And doing kind all of, a, of this. Kind of a doughy, leathery 40 year old man. He doesn't look anything like a, a 20 year old courtesan. <laughs> or I guess she's 18. I think she says at one point. Yeah. But also during this, we get yeah, those we silvers in drag too, which is hilarious. And you know, um, <laughs> the song. I mean, at the end, you they, they, they realize that that he's been farced uh, because he found out through uh, a guy. I think the guy who told him that the plague that they were talking about was played by the Doctor Who actor. I forget what his name is. But um, he says that there's no plague in Crate. It's all revealed at the end, the whole lying, the whole, the whole thing to oh, yeah. cover up the courtesan uh, fiasco comes to a head at the end of this song. And this song, I oh, guess... Wait, 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 we forgot to mention earlier that the, mm -hmm. the, they were able to get Philia out of the brothel because Pseudolus told uh, Marcus Lycus, the, mm -hmm. the procurer, that she had the plague. Oh, yeah. That's a whole uh, thing. And, and like, well, it's like, why don't I take her off your hands? It's okay, because I've had the plague. <laughs> I can't get it again, so I can look after this girl who has the plague. <laughs> It's a completely yeah, what, farcical lie, and I don't. I don't. It, it, the whole other comedy of it is is, is um that people just believe everything they say. It's it's really really hilarious. But the song <laughs> itself, the funeral song itself, is there. Um, I would say mm -hmm. that it's solid. It, it has a great set piece. It has a great great vocals. But I would say that the funeral itself. I, I'm going to give it a download. It's not necessarily my favorite song, but I can't say don't listen to it again because I like the vocals of the captain in the song. I really do. I think his baritone in this works really well. Whitney, what do you give it? Any your final thoughts on it? I'm, this is my least favorite song mm -hmm. in the film and in the show, in fact. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to give it a skip it because wow. lyrics from the Broadway show to fit it into the movie. So it just becomes kind of a funeral dirge. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, you know, all movies want to throw in at least a little bit of emotion, something to get invested in. 
But this film has gone well out of its way to assure you that this is a broad farce and you're, you shouldn't be feeling much of anything. Uh, so to suddenly cut all of the silliness out of the dirge and presented it just as just sort of straight, it becomes this kind of dead weight in the middle of the show or in the middle of the film. And yeah, it's just something that I think you have to, to wait through. Uh, Stephen Sondheim can write some really bright, jaunty melodies, but he's actually better known for melodies that are a little dissonant and off kilter. Um, they're not all like broad Rogers and Hammerstein, major keys, mm -hmm. gigantic, you know, beltway, beltway, uh, belting out numbers. You know, they're not all barn burners. He, you know, he did shows like like Follies and Into the Woods and and Sweeney Todd. You know, these are not things that are, are things you can necessarily sing at karaoke. Mm -hmm. And he's good at that sort of song, but it's not going to play well in a film life way to the forum uh light and it's too silly and if you're going to have this funeral dirge in the middle of this song or in the middle of this film you have to uh include all of the silliness you have to make sure that miles gloriosis can really dig into a lot of uh kind of the strangeness of the situation uh Pseudolus, uh you know zero mostel tries to put it in but i think the two actors aren't necessarily on the same page or maybe they were directed differently here than they were in the broadway show so yeah it, it's it, it's a fine enough dirge but i don't mm -hmm. want a dirge right here i just want, i want a more comedy so pick, pick it up a little bit yeah I can I, I can see where you're coming from. Um, I'm not as like intuitive with the actual Broadway show as like Whitney is or some other oh. people, and I can actually see that viewpoint because you don't get it doesn't it, if you wanted it to feel like a theatrical number, you don't necessarily yeah. get that with this, and it kind of is a bit of a downer. And I get that criticism 110. percent Now, before we get into the finale, there's a couple of plot points that get wrapped up before it that I didn't cover because again, this show we're, we're just going through the songs, but I will cover some of this <laughs> stuff. It is uh, and Buster Keaton plays Erroneous, who is a hero's neighbor who. Is, has been out looking for his son and his daughter. Uh, Buster Keaton, mm. this is his last film role. He passed away during filming through, through the, due to lung cancer. But Buster Keaton comes back to, to town and it's revealed... And what, and what, a, what a champ Buster I Keaton know. appearing in this film in 1966. Yeah. Um, he even, like, he did a lot of his own physical stunts, even though he was rather elderly and kind of infirm at the time. Like, there's a, a scene where he has to throw himself backward into, like, a, an empty uh, horse cart. And he, famous for doing his own stunts, and, you know, that he was willing to do this as an elderly man mm -hmm. and still, you know, be as great as he's always been is, is completely admirable. It was... Mm -hmm. It's just so great. Like, this was the first time I saw Buster Keaton. Like, I'd seen his face before, but I hadn't seen any of his films. And when I finally learned who it is, when you finally have him in context, it makes the, the film so much more impressive. He doesn't have a song, so I'm off track. Yeah, but anyway. I know. I know. But uh, <laughs> no, but I wanted to talk about him because he. this is his last film role, and Buster Keaton is a legend. He directed, like, the silent films that... I feel like the general is one of the best silent films ever made. I'm not going to go Hopefully. into the general right now, but um, I think he did Sherlock Jr., that, that one's a good one. that one's fantastic mm -hmm. but uh he's he's fantastic and he is missed as well but uh, it's introduced that apparently philia and the captain are brother and sister in this it's one of the most coincidental what the fuck moments i've ever seen in a fucking film it's amazing it's <laughs> the whole ending is just like oh let's wrap all this <laughs> stuff up and make it all happy like we promised in the in the title sequence <laughs> it just that's the whole joke of it uh you were saying something well, it, it's that's actually n not unprecedented that <laughs> kind of storytelling where there's all these weird coincidences you look at like not just Oscar Wilde going back to the ancient Roman plays where all of these like f familial connections are finally falling into place. Uh, if you ever, ever read any of the later plays of Shakespeare, stuff like uh, Cymbeline or the winter's tale where they, uh, 
they pile up all this drama at the beginning only to have everything be resolved, not just in the final act, but in maybe the very last scene where all of the, all of the characters are finally gathered on the stage and all of the revelations come out. Ah, oh, and it turns out we're related. I found you after all this time and I was going to get revenge on you, but it turns out you're my dad and whatever it is. And so, uh, it's not just this thing that that they're they're pulling out of their asses. They're actually doing something very astute and very uh, uh, literary when they throw in all of this wild stuff. And it just reveals that this wild stuff still plays because it still feels very modern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I just loved how the ending was just that coincidental. And now that they bring up the, the the comparisons to the actual Roman plays where that actually happens, it makes so much more sense. And the satire there <laughs> is fantastic. Um, then we go into the finale, which is essentially a glorified reprise of um, Comedy Tonight. It's a farewell yeah. reprise of Comedy Tonight. Nothing for kings, nothing for crowns, something for lovers, liars, and clowns. So they, they, they recap all of the story bits yep. <laughs> and let you know that, that this was indeed just a farce. Everything turned out okay, and didn't we all have a great time doing it? Um, The only person who kind of loses out is Senex, who gets to sing a tragedy tonight because his big tragedy was that he didn't get to cheat on his wife. He goes back (laughs) to his his horrible wife. Uh, She's a steely harridan who's kind of this hateable overlord of the house. She's the one everybody fears. And uh, they they even sing at the end of the the comedy tonight reprise is, you know, what is what is the moral? What have we learned here? And they finally just shout out that one of the very last things they say is, morals tomorrow comedy tonight (laughs) so there's no moral this is you know this is tristram shandy this is a cock and bull story nothing came of this we're okay with that that's the whole joke the point of this movie you could argue there was no point there really was no point and it's great because of that and that's what the ending establishes and um it's just i just i just love that tune at the end um so whitney uh what do you give the the finale uh, it's rocking, you know, just like it's a, a reprise. So it, it's a good, not just a good framing device, but it's just good lyrics. It's still a great melody. Um, this one doesn't work quite well out of text like the introduction does. You need to have seen the story to understand what's going on in the lyrics. Yeah. But if you're watching it at the, if you're listening to it, to it at the end of a soundtrack or at the end of a show or at the end of a movie, it all falls into place and yeah. it's fine. And that's what I like. So is yeah, that- definitely a rock. Yeah, if if a musical can start strong, and end strong, it does mm. a good. It at least does some sort of a good job, and the fact that it can end this strong yeah. says a lot. And actually, I didn't mention it, but mm. after the song finishes, you you greeted to this credit sequence with uh, all these flies and stuff, and it's and it's artistic and it's all hand drawn and animated and it's fantastic. I think it's a it's a reference to actually the fly problem they actually had on set because they would keep food out overnight <laughs> and the flies would be everywhere. And I think you can actually see some flies in actual shots still. But um the song itself is fantastic and I agree with Whitney rocking all the way. Mm-hmm. All seven tracks, they all bring at least something to the table. We might not have been a fan of a couple, or some might be weaker than others, but it's still a solid soundtrack. Now we're going to get into the part where it's based on a Broadway show. This is one of the movies we're covering that's based on a Broadway show, and obviously when you're adapting from Broadway, things have to get cut. Things have to get trimmed. Some songs you might think work on the stage, probably don't work well in pacing. They don't necessarily... Yeah, they don't necessarily have to, but yeah, it's easier yeah. to sit through two and a half hours of theater than a two and a half hour film comedy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. indeed, indeed, indeed. But I would say that we're going to discuss a couple of these, um, the seven cut songs from the actual original play, and mm-hmm. we're going to discuss if we think they should have been cut or not. This is pretty simplistic, Whitney. So the first song is Heroes, and a lot of songs from Hero got cut. Like hero yeah. is is pretty disappears throughout the majority of the middle of the movie. Mm. He kind of just like he kind of fades into the background. And it's really focused on Sadalus. But in the play, you get a little bit more of hero and his longing for Philia with a song called "Love I Hear," which he basically is singing to her like Romeo and Juliet as he sees her on top of the the window. There's a scene in the movie where uh, yeah. he's trying to uh, throw her a love note, and mm-hmm. she's not getting it. So uh, 
I, I think this is where the song would go in, in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talking about, he's not singing to her, he's just singing about how great it is to be in love, or so he assumes because he's never been in love before. So the song, love I hear, and you know, the lyrics are stuff like, love I hear makes you sigh a lot. And it's just about being in love, and it's a sweet little love song. It's got some silly lyrics. It actually has one of my very favorite uh, Sondheim lyrics of all. Wow. Uh, where he's talking about how he's being in love, and he says, I pine, I moan, I squeak, I squawk. Today I woke too weak to walk. And it sounds like nonsense, but it's actually just a really strange sentence. Um, yeah, I dig it. I dig a love I hear. Uh, yeah. it, it actually lends a little bit of romance to the show that you would actually need in a live stage production. The film can afford to be a little bit more broad. Uh, if the stage show is going to keep you for the length of a whole musical, you need a little bit more from the lovers. So it's okay mm -hmm. for him to have, for them both to have kind of silly love songs or a little bit more uh, to their pictures. Yeah. And I feel like if this song was actually in the movie, it wouldn't have hurt it, I don't think, because there is a solid song dead zone right at the start of the film. Now, you could have used it, but again, if it was put in the film, you might have lost the impact that Lovely had with the farce of that. So I can actually see why they kind of snippy, snippy, slicey, dicey it out. But um, I would say that it, it could have been cut. What do you think? Should it have been cut or should it not have been cut, Whitney? Uh, from the film, yeah, it should have been cut. Um, I, I actually think maybe only one maybe two of these songs should have been included in the final film um yeah because they're letting sort of the the comedians run amok uh, in between the songs a lot in the movie and that's actually where a lot of the energy comes from mm -hmm. putting too many of these songs in slow things down a little bit while i like love i hear i think yeah putting it right there at the beginning and then chasing it with lovely Killed it. I think if you're going to keep just one of them, keep Lovely. Because yeah. that's the, a song that they get to have together at the very least. Yeah. This, uh, you bring up a good point. There. Out of these songs, me too, I think there's only two songs that would have actually kept in the movie. One of them is this one. This is free. A man should have the rights that all others do. Can you imagine what it will be like when I am? This is sung by Zero Mistel Sadalis, and he's basically, it's basically his whole entire motivation. It's a, it feels like a showstopper. And this is the song that would have been sung in the tree in the film where he's saying, I, if you can give me my freedom, I will get you the girl. He does that through song. And I feel like putting that here in the tree would have been amazing, would have been great. And I, I just wanted to hear Zero yeah. sing more. And I feel like Free is just a fun song. I actually really, really dig this one. I don't know, Whitney, if you agree with me or not, but I think Free should have been in the movie. Well, I, I agree. And, you know, we, we get right away that mm -hmm. he's a slave and he wants, Pseudolus is a slave. He wants to be free. He's always constantly trying to buy his freedom. They give a that a few lines of dialogue, but in order to sort of give the character a little bit more depth, uh, he actually has this song about how great it would be to be free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, again, like all of the songs, it's a little silly, but I think, yeah, Zero Mostel would have been able to sing it really well. And I don't think it would have slowed it down. I actually think it would have put, given the, the film a little bit more punch. Um, so yeah, I, I think this one should have been left in. Yeah, we don't we don't really know. Like I don't. Uh, there's never been like a criteria and a funny thing happened on the way to the form. If something was deleted, we I don't. Th I've even looked for it. I don't think there's been deleted scenes that have been uncovered from this film. I wonder if they actually shot free. Oh. I feel like if I wonder if they did or not. I don't know if you know differently, Whitney, or have has it? no that they. The song, the, there, I don't think there are any deleted songs. I think okay. all the songs we got in the film are the only ones they filmed. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just just making sure of that. Um, the next song, though, is actually a song that's actually frequently cut from the actual production itself when people put it on, is a song called Pretty Little Picture. In the tiber there sits a boat, gently dipping its bow, trim and tidy and built to float. Pretty little picture. Now, Which... It happens after Lovely, and it's essentially Sadalus saying, mm -hmm. "Hey, let's let's just get you guys out of here. Let's make let's get this done as quickly as possible. Let's 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 just let's have you guys live happily ever after. I can live happily ever after. It, it's, let's just get I, this it's done. Ironic. Yeah, it, it's trying to move the plot along, but in order to sing the song, you have to stop the plot. So there's a little <laughs> bit of irony there." Yeah, and um, you know, um yeah, it's, it's, it's not, a pretty the, yeah. little picture. And I'll go for it. Sorry, little about. picture uh, does have some great lyrics. Uh, pretty little picture has uh, some. 
you know, again, jaunty, and we get to sort of sing about how great these two lovers are going to be. It's a little plot centric. You know, the movie misses a, a lot of that, but I think by deleting it out of the film, it makes the film stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, it also has a really terrific Sondheim lyric where Sudalis gets to sort of s- sing things that sound like nonsense when really it's words. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm far behind at the edge of the day and the bong and the bell and the buoy in the bay and the boy and the bride <laughs> and the boat are away. It's it's a really like t- tongue twister and it's fun to hear somebody sing those things. But uh, yeah, it's just not... Uh, Again, in a stage show, when the the story is a little bit more focused on, it's necessary. But in the film, no, it's it's dead weight, and it's okay to cut this one out. Yeah. And this feels like a song that should be performed, not necessarily seen on film. I feel like it would have slowed down the pace, and it would have been a detriment yeah. to the actual final product. And I can see why it was cut. I think we're both on the same page with that one. Uh, this is the other one that I feel like shouldn't have been cut, which is a really funny song called "I'm Calm" by Hysterium. Uh, this yeah. is basically in this in this section where we were talking about uh, the maid song. This happens mm-hmm. during that section where, um, essentially, uh, you're lying to uh, what's his name, um, Senex, Senex, and he's he's yeah. trying to keep calm, trying to keep this lie to himself, and it's comedy gold. I watched a couple of videos of this song on YouTube, and it's hilarious. I I can totally <laughs> see Hysteria doing this, and Hysteria in this movie is one of my favorite characters. So having him uh-huh. sing more would have been fantastic. Uh, what are your thoughts on the "I'm Calm," uh, Winnie? <sighs> I'm Calm is a really terrific song for the version of Hysterium that we got in the stage production. Oh. I think Hysterium, uh, like his namesake, was supposed to be a lot more skittish. Uh, whereas um, Jack Guilford, I keep forgetting Jack his name. Jack Guilford, yeah. Uh, J- Jack Guilford, who played him in the movie, makes the character a lot more confident. And I think that works in the movie, but if you were to suddenly give him this song about how he's you know, panicking and losing his mind, it wouldn't have played well with the character. And I don't think Jack Guilford uh, would have played this song well in the way he played the character. Maybe he could have played him a little bit more panicky, but I think if you got a, a more nervous, someone like, um, I don't know, Jack, Jack, is it Jack Fiedler who played the voice of Piglet? In oh yes, Who, and also in 12 Angry Men. He would have been great. <laughs> been good, like a sort of a really nervous type character. Um, it, it doesn't belong in this version of the film. Okay, I can see that. So even though, even though the, the the song is great, I think you need a different version of the character if you're going to put it in the film. Interesting. That makes things interesting because that's the one song I would have put in. You you wouldn't, which means that there's a song here that you would put in. Uh, it, impossible. Is is a is a song that I feel like um it's the next cut song. He's a lovely blooming flower. He's just a sprout. Impossible. It's between Senex and Hero, and I I, I feel like <laughs> this I this I'm not a fan of the actual song itself. I feel like it's kind of beating it over the head. But I can see that the merit of having both the father and the son having a song together, and you get uh what's who plays Senex um. You get Michael Horton to sing more, and you know his voice yeah. wasn't bad from what we heard in the actual film. So, Impossible would have been decent. I don't know if it would have necessarily helped the film, though. What are your thoughts on Impossible, Whitney? Uh, Impossible was a good way to sort of establish that the father and the son like had a relationship, which they don't really bother to do in the movie. They're just sort of both in the same house. <laughs> uh, I can take or leave it. Actually, I think. Um, it wouldn't have necessarily slowed things down. I think it would have shown that they do have a relationship. The only problem is it's not funny. Uh, there's there's not a lot of pep or energy to this song. It's just sort of showing the generation gap, and that's not what this film is interested in doing. Um, there's If they could have staged it in such a way where everything was really kind of broad and silly, yeah. But uh, it would have need, needed to have been staged just right. Yeah, and uh, that's probably why I I would say that we wouldn't have put because it didn't feel like a farce. It didn't feel like you would have gotten a lot yeah. of laughs from it. So that's a mm-hmm. good point indeed. Going off of that, Dominia has her own song, "That Dirty Old Man." For over 
Her name is Dominia, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> yeah, she, she's the bitch of the movie, and it's fantastic. And she plays it up really or, well. Or, or not, not Dominia, she's, she's uh, Do- Domina. Domina. So she dominates everything. Uh, she's played by an actress named, let me look her up, uh, Patricia Jessel. Patricia Jessel. And, uh, and she plays the part really well, and she's a really sort of fearsome character, especially in some of the opening scenes. She sa- gets to say very evilly things like, ooh, hanging them upside down by the feet and being whipped. They hate that. Uh, yeah, she she's really terrific, uh, and I wish we could have seen more of her. She's too much of a plot point in the movie. Yeah, this is the this is her song, and this is the song you need to have in the movie. I think. Oh, you when do. When she learns that, but well, yeah. when she learns that Senex is running off and trying to have an affair with this maid, you know, we get to know that she actually like kind of hates him, but also still kind of loves him and cares about how this is going to turn out. And it kind of humanizes the character a little bit. Plus, it's a it's a very funny song. I really like "Impossible." Oh, uh, look, yeah, uh, the, the, he's the, always taking advantage of me. He's always abusing me. Oh, if he would only abuse me, you know that that the, their marriage is just sort of a sham at this point. But she's willing to to give it a, another go. I I kind of like that. And I like the title of it too. That dirty old man. It is a very fun. It, that dirty old man. Yeah, yeah, that dirty old man. And you know, um, I kind of now that you're explaining it. Um, better because I only listened to it out of context. I wasn't familiar with the show when I listened to this song. I didn't like it. Okay. But now that you explained it to me in the context of that, it's actually in the in the actual th- thing itself. She should have had her own uh-huh. song. I, I'm changing my mind. She really yeah. should have had her own song, and it probably would have bumped her up for me because she was kind of to me. She had a lot of presence at the beginning of the film, but she really lost it until she came back to the house and saw all the people oh. around. They're, they're out. She's yeah. gone for most of the film. She leaves and there's this you know this big deal of how they're leaving and mm-hmm. uh, you know they, they break a statue on the way out and she just sort yeah. of goes on her way and then at the end of the film she's just back again there's sort of no mm-hmm. like scene where she got word like she does say i got word and i came back and i understand sort of the surprise of her suddenly showing up mm-hmm. and how that works in a farce but uh a, a scene the where scene, she gets the yeah. and like she sings this song on the road as she's heading back wouldn't have been com- out of place at all. It would have been mm-hmm. fine. Would have been a good transition piece, actually. Not, come to think of that, so yeah, you're, you're and, on and, the and it would have spru- it would have spruced up the the second half of the movie as well, when there aren't a lot of songs other than that that boring funeral dirge. So mm-hmm. I think having a a song of kind of comic intensity to sort of offset that funeral dirge would have been a good good addition to the film. Fantastic, and um, I would say that this last one is very forgettable to me. I don't really think that Philia and uh, Dominia had had any sort of relationship in the actual movie to begin with, to have her sing. Like, yeah. I'll show him. Uh, um, that'll show him. It, it kind of um, is just referenced partially that this man raped and pillaged her family or something, whatever she was talking about. And he was a monster oh. and a mongol and... and, and I think just saying that through dialogue would have been better than through this song that'll show him, which uh, this is forgettable. Uh, Whitney, what are your thoughts on that? will show him. Um, uh, Again, this is, this is one that I think plays better on stage when Philia has like a little bit more to do when she's just sort of a plot point in the film, maybe you don't want her to sing that much and have that much uh, emotion or, or conflict, just having, having her say kind of blithely, Oh, I don't want to marry him is just enough in the film. (laughs) Giving her this whole song about how she's going to get her revenge by treating him as well as possible is kind of a silly concept. It might be a little too broadly silly and, too dark for the movie like yeah this guy killed everybody i know so i'm going to like massage his feet every night i understand what the joke is uh and on stage that might be funny when everything's a little bit just in front of you yeah i I don't i don't think it would have really worked here plus it's right near the end of the show and it would have just halted everything yeah and i feel like it actually... like right, 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 right when the right when the action is building and everybody needs to be getting together and everybody's running around to stop and have a song in that moment would have been death. Yeah, and I feel like as you said, it kind of also takes <clears throat> away from the fact that she's a MacGuffin. So having her have more of this oomph to her would have actually mm. taken away from the joke 
because that's basically what she yeah, was yeah, throughout yeah. the movie and that's 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 the whole point of her character so guys that was the cut songs of the actual broadway show again of of the 14 songs in the show seven made it into the movie this happens when you adapt a show and you know what for the better and since we're talking about it now maybe it was for the better that most of them got cut yeah so we're going to move on to the final part of the show, Whitney. This is where we we rate, uh, we rank each song from the, from the film from worst to best. Just tell me what your worst was to your best one. All seven uh, tracks, and uh, that'll be it. So, Whitney, what what uh, what uh, is your list? Okay, well, worst would be the funeral sequence, mm -hmm. uh, followed by uh, going going working my way up the list, um, going up to bring me my bride, <laughs> um, lovely. Everybody ought to have a maid. The lovely reprise, uh, the finale, and then comedy tonight. Uh, though that's sort of the from worst to best, the ranking of uh, oh. the songs we got to. It's hear. actually pretty close to mine. I said my worst was the funeral yes. sequence. Then bring bring me my bride. Then uh, lovely, the finale. Then lovely, the reprise. Then everybody ought to be a maid. And I have the opening uh, uh, comedy tonight as my number one. It was, I love that song to death. And I love Bride. Uh, I mean, and I love Maid. So, you know, this, this, this movie in general was so fun to watch. So before we close out, Whitney, what are your final thoughts on A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Four? Um, it, it, I mean, this is one that's le like, like I said in the introduction, this is certainly a film that is ripe for uh, rediscovery. Richard Lester is one of those filmmakers who, uh, like everyone knows his body of work because he did Help and he did A Hard Day's Night. Uh, and like cineasts really know who he is and they really discuss his filmography in great detail. But he's rarely mentioned in very casual conversations of who the great filmmakers might be. Um, he is, he is one of the finer, uh, more notable British filmmakers because of stuff like, not just A Hard Day's Night, but because of stuff like A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. He is a really sharp comedian. He always cast really funny people. And that he and he's kind of a perfect match for such a frothy show as A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. I think uh, it is definitely worthy of rediscovery. Uh, if you have a Filmstruck uh, subscription, you can... Uh, see it through that uh, it's also readily readily available on home video uh it's out there and i think it's one one of the better comedies of the 60s so you should definitely see it yeah but it's a very underrated comedy too because i, I feel like it's it's a it's 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 fairly obscure and as you said richard lester is 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 a master stroke of a director you know him from from help you know him from the three musketeers movies it's sad that he decided to retire when roy kinnear passed away on that that um horseback riding incident that was sad yeah because uh, we could have had uh, Roy, so many can, we can Roy can as, as the gladiator guy yeah he's yeah as, as the sort of really soft-spoken <laughs> very gentle uh gladiator instructor mm -hmm. who's teaching this oaf how to murder people <laughs> and he gets killed and so they have this long they have this long line of slaves then he's just killing them one right after the other but his technique isn't quite good enough so roy kinnear says oh no that, that wasn't very good. Try it with your backhand. Whomp! Oh, no, try try murdering the next one over. Yo, that's very nice. Very... <laughs> He's, he's so funny gosh that scene is yeah. boring. and uh we lost him too soon as well uh, Roy Kinnear you know him yeah. best you know him best as Veronica's father in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory uh he is fantastic and uh, he's sorely missed but this this film itself back on track this film itself is fantastic uh the musical I mean some songs do leave a little bit to be desired but as a movie itself and as a forest itself Mm -hmm. You got to check it out. And um, I know yeah, the soundtrack sure. to this film is fairly, fairly rare. But if you can track it down and if you can find it, download it, do what you will. It's fantastic to listen to. So, um, Whitney, that does it for our show, Suddenly Soundtracks, where we dissect a movie song by song and judge a movie solely based on the soundtrack that it provides. So, Whitney, where can the good people find you online? Uh, oh golly, I'm all over the internet. Um, uh, I, I have a thriving porn career. No, I'm exactly. Kidding. Um, yep. I, I am uh, uh, currently co-hosting two different podcasts, both with the venerable uh, Mr. William Bibiani. Uh, one is canceled too soon, where uh, he and I talk about short-lived TV shows. Um, I'm not sure when this is going up, but uh, as of this recording, our latest episode is going to be for the Dresden Files. Uh, 
on uh, we also review movies and uh, do fun movie uh, pairings and series runs uh, over on Critically Acclaimed, which you can get through the Schmoes No Network. Um, my some of my writings go up on IGN here and there. Uh, I contribute to other websites if they'll have me, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you can look me up on on the Twitters as well. I'm in in the social media world. Awesome. When he brings up a good point, this is actually part of the series of suddenly soundtracks that are building up to the Schmodown free for all. So every mm. week in March, we are going to be doing this. So this is actually going to be released in March, Whitney, just so you know that. Oh, okay. So yeah, so uh, this is awesome. Thank you so much, Whitney, for coming. You can find me uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Chris Clark 8788 Those numbers mean nothing. Or you can find me <laughs> on YouTube at No Man's Land Entertainment. So from Whitney Seibold and myself, make sure you, 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 you go to their Patreon. The link is in the layout right above Whitney's head. So uh, anyway, guys, keep rocking. <laughs> take care. And let's rock this sucker. Good night. Boom.